thank you very much for uh, having accept me uh, in this in this uh, congress, which is unfortunately unfortunately made by Zoom. I would much rather be there with you in Brazil, but I'm in Portugal, <laughs> and we are uh, almost um, getting into autumn season, so not that good for us here. But anyway, I'm a I'm gonna hope I do my best. Um, so this presentation I will be doing for you guys is about is a little piece uh, about my um, on my on my master's dissertation, and I have to in the, uh, I have to stress this that uh, I'm just doing a dissertation. I'm not defending a full-on thesis, um, just as I would do, for instance, in a PhD level. So I am uh, now developing my master's dissertation and this is a piece of it uh, it's not about a philosopher it's about an economist and uh, it's about uh, a philosophical uh, view and critique on this uh, economist's work um, and uh, what this economy uh, economist do gary becker he does of course uh, an economical theory which i think is philosophical in its start. So uh, we'll, we shall see that in a moment. I didn't do a slide doing my uh, with the presentation of, of my table of contents or the details. So first of all, I'll just say to you very briefly, first of all, I will present Gary Becker's thought in one particular work. Uh, second of all, I will be presenting two empirical uh, most str striking cases I found. Third, I will point out the incoherencies in these cases and how, uh, how it harms Becker's uh, theory. Um, and I will be doing this by showing uh, the direct critiques of John Elster and Peter Swan, who are philosophers. And fourth, and uh, lastly, I will suggest further consequences as a conclusion and leave it open for the Q&A. So to start. Who is Gary Becker? So just for you to know, since you are philosophers and some of you might not know him, um, uh, he is Gary Stanley Becker. He uh, was born in 30, died in 14. He's a Chicago economist, former student Milton Friedman. is, of course, as you can uh, conclude, a neoclassical economic thinker. And he devoted his life to the development of econometrical ways of thinking social interaction, uh, social in interactions as well as personal emotional detail uh, choices so just so you know another uh, trivia of, about gary becker he was he was a, uh, an, an economic uh, an, uh, an economics professor at chicago but he was also a sociology professor so he must have some account on that too but so we shall see that now so which work am i following uh i'm i'm following uh accounting for case uh, Sorry, is anyone just, I'm hearing some noise in the background. I don't know if, uh, uh, so the work I'm, I'm, I'm studying is Accounting for Taste, uh, is a compilation of multiple works along uh, uh, during his active period as an academic. It's Becker's most complete work on human capital, which is the great, uh, subject object of study he was he was interested in. So accounting for uh, accounting for taste's big statement is this one. So an agent cultivates his or her preferences, which are habits, addictions, desires, or goals, through the consumption he or she has over time, and this behavior is incorporated in the agent's social network, where he or she experiences the influence of others preferences of other people's preferences in his or her social network. So this statement will lead uh, to an extended utility function. That's his goal to do just one utility function that will uh, sort it out, uh, that will sort out everything. And so how uh, can one do this? Through the development of two main concepts, the two main concepts, uh, concepts around which accounting for taste evolves around uh, and um, 
it is also uh, these uh, these two main com concepts that will divide the the, the work um, into two um, big pieces. So it's personal capital and social capital. These are two uh, sub concepts of what I've said before of of human capital. Human capital is basically these two concepts uh, aligned. So what is personal capital? Personal capital is the accumulation of past consumption, past experience, and past how will affect present and future utility. Of course, that we know that utility, uh, utility is what we derive from our actions and we desire. So, um, the, uh, so this past action will just uh, be what we are now and what we desire now to and what we will be in the future and we, what we will desire in the future <clears throat> so for example sophia uh, is a great pianist because she has 10 years of continuous training and so she now practices the piano almost every single day it's a very intuitive example and this is just the utility function for personal capital that he Becker presents in his book. It is not very relevant, but I'm just telling you that it is uh, the whole, <laughs> it is a whole of, so X, Y, and Z are different goods, and P and S uh, stand for personal capital, and S for as uh, social capital, and T, of course, is a period of time, uh, past time, so somewhere around the past until now and onto the future so this is predictive so how are these habits and addictions formed are there two important concepts for uh, the formation of these preferences that are so strong in our lives complementarity and reinforcement another example so sophia regularly eats cornflakes for breakfast since she was eight years old. Today, when her mother goes shopping, Sophia goes with her in order to get the cornflakes she so much, so much enjoys. So reinforcement and complementarity are two very intuitive concepts. Once more, reinforcement stands just for the repetition of an action over time, and complementarity stands for every action that is not the action of eating in this case, but uh, every action that will lead to the eating of cornflakes that she so much desires. Okay, so what is social capital now? Social capital is the accumulation of peer influences in an agent's uh, personal capital. And so it can be in the form of a network, a simple network, um, online or not online, society, control a control system uh, whatever you want to call it but it has to have of course more than one agent <clears throat> it is not strictly dependent on the agent's choices uh, obviously uh, it can raise or lower utility we shall see that in further um, in the presentation but it's fairly intuitive too uh, so for example sophia's colleagues at school smoke cigarettes during class break Sophia starts smoking to be recognized as a cool kid by her colleagues. So Sophia, what she made was a choice in order to raise her social capital. But, uh, okay, I will just explain this, but I will uh, develop it. The, the thing with lower uh, raise or lower t utility, I will develop, uh, develop it further. But I uh, will just say that, so this is a, a very uh, um, good case. So Sophia uh, in, engages in, in uh, cigarette smoking in order to raise her social capital, but her personal capital in, uh, uh, along the way can be um, lowered down um, um, because of, I mean, uh, health issues or uh, something like that. Because, you know, smoking is not that cool. <laughs> so, Okay, bear with me and Becker, because this is all Becker's um, examples. So what does Becker do in this work, in this big work? He does an extended utility function, as I said, 
which is an inclusion of consumption capital, consumption capital, consumption of objects, into the realm of human capital, which is, as we've seen, personal capital and social capital, not only to explain preferences formation, but also to predict, to predict future action. So this is the function, X for being objects, P and S, personal capital and social capital. I do think, uh, just uh, to note, I, I do think that th this future actions cannot be a long, uh, a long term future uh, action, but it cannot be long term thoughts. Uh, it has to be medium or, or close uh, term um, thoughts. Uh, I don't know how, how, how he thought of this because it's not very um, well explained in, in the book um, because he uh, spends a lot of time with maths. Uh, but uh, I, I do think that this will work better or will work, work best with, with close uh, and medium uh, uh, term uh, actions and choices. Anyway, Becker suggests uh, uh, that many of our actions or every action is in favor of a preference and therefore is an utility maximization action. This idea is what stands for rationality. So I do have a problem with this. <laughs> Um, it is a very, very broad concept of rationality. Every uh, economist uh, of the neoclassical school um, endorses this, this concept. However, I did not um, find any author, any economic, uh, econ economics author that uh, um, explores this concept of broad rationality that they so, that they talk about. I do understand that it is a rationality, um, a practical rationality. Uh, I mean, ways for getting, it means to, to get to some ends, of course, but um, uh, <clears throat> I do not, I do not understand in Becker's work and in other uh, authors' work, uh, what are the criteria for, for this rationality? What makes uh, an action um, rational and so uh one of the things that i didn't write but i i i i can i can say just now it is that uh, rationality in broad terms just like this uh seems to me to be trivial so i don't think it works um very well so anyway uh i have two empirical cases as i've said that uh, that have struck me uh, um, a lot in, in the studying uh, of Gary Becker's uh, work. So the first one is music taste or musical taste as you want. So in this essay that is actually the gusti was known as disputando or taste is not disputable, however, uh, whatever. Uh, it is uh, an essay in the book. So as I told you, it's a compilation. So this is the most famous essay of the book. In this essay, Becker suggests that marginal utility, um, rise, rise, I, said, I said rises, sorry, it's a type of raises over time, but tastes shift in their favor. So just to understand this, marginal utility, first of all, is the utility that we get. You may know this, but it, it's economic uh, uh, jargon. So anyway, marginal utility is the utility that we get uh, after a lot of consumption of one good. Um, so, for instance, uh, so uh, for instance, if I get one hamburger now, that has a lot of utility, but the hamburgers will um, the hamburgers value will lower over time, and the marginal and I'll have to consume more in order to get utility. So that's the marginal utility. So it raises it raises over time <laughs> because tastes shift in their favor. So I will consume uh, in, in order to, to get that, that, that marginal utility growing. So it creates, he creates, he, apparently he creates a parallelism between addictive goods such, such as drugs, which is striking, and art goods such as music, as I said. So the music argument is firstly given by Alfred Marshall, another economist, and he says the following, there is, however, an implicit condition in this law of diminishing marginal utility, which can be made clear. 
it is that we do not suppose time to be allowed for any alteration in the character of taste of the man himself. It is therefore no exception uh, to the law that the more good music a man hears, the strong is his taste for it likely to become. Katarina, so, sorry, uh, five minutes. Okay. So I'm going to rush. The music tastes uh, sh change over t uh, with time and age, age and exposure. Exposure is being around uh, people and, and spaces that have that good in order for us to consume it. The shadow plot price falls. The shadow price um, is what we have to pay in order to get that good other than money. And skill, as skill as an experience in music taste are acquired. So this is another case. So Sophia started listening to classical music when she was very young. She enjoyed Vivaldi and the Magic Flute best. She was so interested on the subject. She downloaded every piece of classical music she found and spent hours listening to it. When she became a grown woman, she preferred Shostakovich and Wagner. She no longer spent hours listening to every classical music piece. She only listened to what she found to be legitimate art. So she had a lot of exposure and she gained skill and experience. Okay, drug addiction. Unlike music, Becker considers drugs to be harmful, of course. Consistent consumption of drugs creates a demand for more. The consumption of drugs over time diminishes the marginal utility, unless there is reinforcement and consistency, as, as we said, and of course there is. There is a growth in use with, rec with recurrent exposure. Okay. So this is another case. I will, uh, I will uh, skip this. So what ideas do we extract from Becker's work? I do uh, extract consistent con that consi consistent consumption is a beneficial of a beneficial good, can raise one's social capital and personal and, and personal capital, since consumption or reveal prefer preferences, the preferences that we know other people are making or we manifest are in many cases conspicuous consumption cases. So cons conspicuous stands for the preferences we show in order to get social status. Consistent consumption of a harmful good does lower one's personal capital and it also might lower one's social capital. So this has problems, speculation about empirical facts in order to make an econometrical model work vague concept of rationality and a so ambiguous view on a rational choice theory. So, <clears throat> I don't know how to do this, but uh, so this is the defense that, Becker's, uh, that Becker do. Uh, developing taste for music should not be seen as a refutation for, uh, of the principle of diminishing marginal utility. And now we have two empirical challenges, but I uh, will only uh, show you one, audios, Joanna enjoys the Blue Danube vaults. Joanna enjoys, uh, uh, he, she has uh, uh, a network composed by people with common education. Sophia enjoys well-tempered clavier. Sophia reads art uh, studies at Oxford University. So, these are the results. These are very, very intuitive. I will skip the, <laughs> and just say that Suppose that Joanna and Sophie are friends, this, this uh, to show an incoherence. And so uh, they are components of each other's social capital. If high social capital depends on the consumption of Joanna and her friends, this will obviously maintain her social capital. But if Joanna's social capital includes Sophia and Sophia has a high social capital, capital of her own, then Joanna will have, again, a high social capital, while Sophia can have a lower one from listening to the Blue Danube because she's very eerie. Why? It is conspicuous consumption to listen to uh, these these uh, the, these pieces, and so uh, what would be rational following Becker would be for, for Joanna for Sophia to distance herself from Joanna, but this is far fetched, right? So just another critique. Just to, to say that we will, uh, there's a problem with the drug ag uh, addiction uh, case. 
So I'm counting one and two, drug, ad, uh, drug addiction and music. So these are, um, the st this is the standard concept of physical capital. So I will skip this, but just to say, each investment lowers utility below what would otherwise have been, but it's nevertheless undertaken because it promises to generate more utility in the future. So bear with me on this. I'm almost finishing, sorry. So there is this thing about imagination capital that shifts your, that changes your taste, uh, your, your preferences, only to think about it. So there is not a fully understood idea of what imagination of capital might be. So just to think of what it would be for me to be a drug addict um, deters me from, do, from doing drugs. Okay, still not very well understood as a concept. It is not legitimate to expect people, uh, that people will try to reduce that rate, uh, their rate of time discounting when concerned with long-term concerns. It is incoherent to think about intentional change of preferences. So this is argument, I will not read it, it's just this. Elster, what Elster is trying to show is that uh, people will most likely uh, prefer a case um, to not taking the pill, spending all the money, and then in retirement having less money just in order to have more pleasure and maximizing utility in the short term uh, or the close term uh, time period. I'm very sorry, this is getting uh, rushed out. So this is these are the conclusions. So this is about the features that I've just shown you. So these features. My conclusions are that Gary Becker's contribute to economic thought and social sciences is relevant but has a lot of empirical work to be done. The single utility function that combines social capital and personal capital altogether may work for some consuming behavior cases, but not all. And this work seems to require a development of epistemology and normativity since it leaves the door open to many problems like false anthropological assumptions, legitimacy of some actions in the name of rational utility maximization and public choice false assumptions. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry because I extended myself. Thanks, Catarina. No problem. We have a question from Nitamar. Uh, does Becker's conception of human capital and social capital refer back to a rational choice, utilitarian view of rationality, such as that of the homo economicus? Yes. Uh, yes, it does. Um, it is, he tries not to, he tries to ex escape from uh, the egoist, egoistical view, like I only do things that benefit me uh, in time. Um, but he, I don't think he succeeds. He has a, a very curious uh, thought experiment, as he says it is. It is about a rotten kid. He says, basically, the conclusion is that if a parent is good for their kids, then in the long term and in the long term so imagine that a parent has a lot of kids and one of them is very bad behaved but even that one in the long term will have in uh, incentives to behave well and re retribute to uh, his or her her parents in the future so this shows two things um no, this this shows that this might show that uh, parents are egoistical or egotistical in having kids, but um, he tries to show that the rotten kid uh, is actually being uh, 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 being um, encouraged to 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 be um, I mean just more open, well behaved, and uh, altruistic. Um, so he does not, he, he, he cannot shift very well, he cannot uh, escape very well from the thing, uh, from the classical view of homo economicus. So yes, I do think um, that he refers back to that kind of view, that kind of classical view. Yes. I have a short question. Yeah. Please, Sophia. Uh, hi, Katrina. 
Hi. Nice, nice to see you. <laughs> so you you said that you think, and maybe it's all already proven that Becker's view uh, has a lot to. You can develop many empirical research based on it. Yes. Uh, this research is. Uh, were already done or you or they are starting right now ah, okay um i can see what you uh, uh, what you mean um uh, becker is um is criticized for being just doing uh, for doing sp speculative work in uh, in what comes to empirical cases um there are a lot of Uh, economists that already study these, these issues with uh, empirical grounds. Um, but uh, what I see in the literature is not empirical work. It is the economists, uh, the, the, uh, theoretical e economics, uh, academics, and now philosophers trying to beat <laughs> uh, Gary Becker's thinking just to say that, no, this is not right. Even though um, this can be right in some empirical cases, the principles are very, very strange. Just to put everything in, in life in just to one huge utility function that will predict basically everything. <laughs> so, yeah, we have more of theoretical work, less than empirical work. Thanks, Katarina. We don't have any more time for <laughs> questions. Thank you.